So here's part three. I cut part two off a little bit abruptly because my son interrupted me. But here is part three. So let's talk a little bit about the NOACs. We talked a little bit about rivaroxaban at the low dose. The novel oral anticoagulants or direct oral anticoagulants, um, so some call them NOACs, some call them DOACs, um, I think are a pretty major advance. Um, more and more patients are being switched away from warfarin to these medicines. They seem to have uh, equal uh, benefit as far as preventing blood clots. Uh, and the Eliquis actually has shown superiority uh, as far as uh, not causing as much bleeding as warfarin. So the Eliquis really does seem to be the one that has the most data for it. Rivaroxaban is very close. It's not inferior to warfarin. Doesn't really have an advantage, but it's no worse. If you have coupons for that and you don't have coupons for Eliquis, uh, or if you're worried that somebody's not going to take it twice a day because Eliquis is a twice a day medicine and Rivaroxaban is a once a day medicine, uh, it's worth um, using the river oxaban, but most folks are, are starting to use the Eliquis. Um, the Bavixa is actually a medicine that's been uh, compared head to head with an oxaparin in the hospital for DVT prevention. So uh, an injectable medicine uh, and found to be um, comparable. So I think we're gonna start to see in patients that can take oral medications that they'll uh, be using the um, Patrixaban, um, but again, I don't do inpatient, so I'm really not sure what's going on with that at this point. A bunch of new inhalers are out. Um, basically, the biggest change is the Elipta device, which is one click instead of two like the Advair. Um, the other advantage of these Elipta medicines is almost all of them are once a day, uh, whereas most of the other uh, inhalers are at least twice a day, uh, with the exception, of course, of the uh, Spiriva. Um, these uh, have uh, slightly different um, long-acting beta agonists and often slightly different long-acting muscarinic antagonists. Um, so these uh, combination medicines um, do seem to have certain advantages. I actually tried the Brio Elliptic for myself. I didn't find it lasted 24 hours for me. It lasted about 20 hours. So again, that may be a cytochrome P450 uh, thing in my system, but uh, I went back to the Advair for myself. The Anoro is a great medicine for uh, COPD. Um, obviously, um, there is still the concern of using a long-acting beta agonist without a steroid. Uh, since we did find in people with asthma that uh, there was an increased mortality rate, um, we do know that with COPD that we have not found that. Um, so lots of times in people with COPD, um, there's not really any data that the steroid improves their numbers, but it does often improve their um, perception of their quality of life. So very frequently we'll have people with COPD on these um, triple uh, medications. The Trilogy actually has all three, a beta agonist and anticholinergic, also known as a long-acting muscarinic antagonist. Uh, and a steroid, um, and it's once a day. Uh, it, it would be just a, a single copay, so um, there are more patients that are being switched over to this trilogy. Um, basically, I think we're just going to have to wait and see. I'm a guy that doesn't prescribe a lot of medicines until they've been out for several years, but uh, we'll see how these play out. The memantine is a medicine that's used for um, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the um, presentation at um, Lincolnville. I'm going to take a lot of these uh, numbers off, um, but basically it's a relatively modest effect. Um, you're seeing three or four points on a hundred point scale. Um, you're seeing a little bit of a decrease in agitation, um, you know, um, as far as new onset agitation. It's not really any evidence that it'll decrease the agitation that's previously there. Unfortunately for people with Alzheimer's disease, there's not a lot of options and they're looking for anything that you can give them. Um, but this uh, uh, memantine, um, uh, also known as Namenda, which is an NMDA uh, receptor um, antagonist, um, will uh, uh, sometimes have modest benefits. So pain control, um, you know, I think that uh, there's great concerns amongst uh, many of us in regards to uh, um, 
with the great concerns for opioid addiction and opioid overdose. Uh, there is concern that maybe we're under treating pain at this point. I know that's a politically unpopular thing to talk about, but I did want to talk about some of the alternative pain control measures and the actual data on their effectiveness um, so that we can talk about whether or not we really do need to use opioids. Lyrica, um, in a six month study in people with fibromyalgia, um, did have you know, substantial benefit over placebo. Um, the people um, that had therapeutic response at the end of six months with placebo it was 33%, with Lyrica it was 53%. That means at least half the people did not have therapeutic response at the end of six months. Um, and, and the difference between placebo and Lyrica is relatively modest. The other medicine that's often talked about is gabapentin. Um, they talk about how it's effective for shingles. The only study that I was able to find that said this was from the Indian Journal of Dermatology. Um, in the uh, um, dosing that um, one would usually do, which would be, um, you know, uh, 300 or 600. Uh, if we look at the placebo um, pain ratings, we can see at week zero, it's 92. Um, all the others are roughly similar. Uh, we can see at the end of the first week that it's 94, uh, and that goes down to 81 or 82. Um, by the fourth week, we can see it's 85, and the um, uh, the lower doses at 69 and the higher doses are around 60. Um, I think that if you tell me that your pain is going to go from an eight and a half to a six, I think that that's useful if we're talking about decreasing the amount of pain medicine. I don't think it's equivalent to giving people narcotic pain medicine if they have shingles. Uh, and I do think that shingles is painful enough that one really might want to think about providing some relief. NSAIDs. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of people switch to NSAIDs to try to get off of narcotics. Not a bad thing if they're taking relatively low doses for short periods of time. The problem is, is that over a long period of time, NSAIDs are medicines that do have substantial side effects. At least 1% to 5% of patients on NSAIDs, especially long term, will have significant side effects. Um, you can have kidneys. Um, there are definitely patients on dialysis because of NSAIDs. Uh, I have had patients come in and say they have dental pain and they just took two 800 ibuprofens. Uh, you know, unfortunately, that's dangerous for the kidneys. It's also dangerous for the stomach, uh, causing a GI bleed. We also note that NSAIDs are associated with higher risk of cardiovascular uh, heart attacks, as well as raising the blood pressure. So. Um, they're, they're a good adjunct. Um, there may be some patients that can be managed just with NSAIDs, um, but uh, again, they are not medicines that uh, are without risk. The other thing to remember in regards to narcotics, um, getting back to cytochrome P450, um, at least 30% of the population uh, has a genetic polymorphism that basically prevents codeine from being metabolized into morphine. Uh, so in other words, 30% of the population will get no benefit from codeine. Um, there's also a substantial number that don't get any benefit um, from tramadol uh, just because they have, you know, a, a disorder of that cytochrome uh, uh, 2D6 um, um, cytochrome P450 enzyme. So uh, if they don't respond to codeine, there's a pretty good chance that they won't respond to tramadol either. Um, these are our alternatives to the stronger medications, um, but again, you want to make sure that uh, they're going to work for people if you're going to use them. Tramadol has a substantial serotonin effect as well, uh, and of course, you have to be very careful with other serotonin medicines, SSRIs, um, you know, migraine medicines, uh, you know, the, the tryptin type migraine medicines, um, because you can get a serotonin syndrome, which can be pretty dramatic. Cannabis, not going to talk a lot about cannabis, but just to remind us that it is on the horizon as a pharmacologic uh, change. Um, a lot of patients are using the CBD, which is, you know, not got any THC in it. THCA is actually the THC before it's activated. Um, and so uh, it is not controlled and does not show up in the urine. Um, lots of research, um, you know, 
is being attempted for these. Unfortunately, we are trying to make up for many, many years without researching it. So um, there's lots of anecdotal stories out there. There's some very good research, but um, we're going to have to stay tuned on that one. Forteo is the PTH, the parathormone hormone uh, analog that we were talking about. It's the only med that actually does stimulate osteoblasts. It's very expensive. It has a fair amount of side effects. It's not used very often, um, but in patients with really severe um, osteoporosis, we probably should be considering it more. Toenail fungus is something that was on TV. The Jubilee ads were uh, really being pushed. Uh, Jubilee was supposed to be used for at least 11 months. It was $600 a month, so therefore it was uh, over $6,000 for the treatment. It was about 23% effective. Um, this is why I think we're not seeing the ads very much anymore. Vicks VapoRub, if you put it on the toenails, is about 25% effective and is a lot cheaper, but um, smells bad for a lot of people. Uh, there are laser treatments that have mixed um, insurance coverage, but most insurances really don't cover them. Uh, oral Lamisil is about 60% effective. You have to leave them on for at least 6 to 12 weeks. It's only about $20 a month. Uh, we used to check uh, liver function tests before, during, and after. Um, they say now that the chance of liver damage is only about 1 in 100,000. Uh, so the uh, prescribing information does not require the liver tests, but a lot of folks will still do that. Um, one of the things with toenail fungus is you really should send a toenail off for analysis to prove that it is, in fact, a fungal infection. This costs about $150. If somebody's going to do the vapor rub, I just tell them to go ahead and do it. Um, unfortunately, um, there's not a, a lot of great options for these folks. Vitamin D, um, everybody's hot on vitamin D. Uh, there was some evidence, uh, which we'll show you on the next slide, that talked about decreasing falls, although I think this evidence is pretty modest. Uh, there's lots of arguments about what's the appropriate level. Um, we do uh, um, have some evidence that intermittent high-dose vitamin D actually seems to increase the risk of fractures. Uh, there's no data that I'm aware of uh, other than one recent study that did seem to talk about some benefit with depression that really does talk about the uh, benefits of um, um, vitamin D. Um, we know that low vitamin D is associated with a lot of problems. We're not really sure whether supplementing it fixes those problems, however. So here's that uh, chart that I was talking about. Um, at 200, 400, and 600, there was no evidence of benefit for falls. Uh, with uh, 800, there did seem to be uh, a, a decreased incidence of falls. Maybe at a higher dose, it would be even better. Lots of studies are being uh, undertaken uh, regarding vitamin D supplementation. Uh, I do think it's kind of telling that we really have not been able to identify a lot of hard benefits for that to this point. Diabetes medicines and cardiovascular outcome, Jardians and a couple of the others have really been pushing that they are the medicines that have shown cardiovascular benefit. In fact, metformin and pioglitazone have actually been shown to have some cardiovascular benefit um, because they improve the lipid profile, they improve weight and improve blood pressure. Um, the GLPs, which are injectable, also have a benefit, which is why the Jardians ads um, have started to uh, say the only pill that's approved um, as a cardiovascular benefit. Uh, the SGLT2s, um, which are Jardians, Invokana, Farsiga, uh, they have benefit. Um, we'll review that benefit on the chart on the next page. Uh, the DPP4s, um, which basically are the... Um, Oral equivalent, or at least as close to an equivalent as you can get of the GLP-1s, have been shown to have no benefit as far as cardiovascular benefit. The SGLT2s, there's a number of different studies out there that are, are questioning whether they have a slightly increased risk of amputation. Uh, there was something in uh, MedPage that uh, really does talk about use of big data. I think that big data is going to... Um, um, if not supplement RCTs, really change the way we look at RCTs. Um, but the big data really does not seem to suggest that there is a true risk of increased amputations in these folks. But it is something that's been reported and something that you do need to think about. So uh, this is basically the uh, Jardiance data, the impagliflozin data. 
um, we show that uh, uh, it's showing non-inferiority and in fact superiority for um, death from cardiovascular causes um, uh, as well as non-fatal MIs. Uh, we also show that it shows uh, benefit from um, death from any cause that uh, in the empagliflozin group, it was only 5.7%, where it was 8.3% in the placebo group. We don't see any benefit as far as MIs. We don't see any benefit as far as silent MIs. We don't see any benefit as far as angina. And interestingly, most of the real benefit here has actually been in relation to heart failure. Uh, why is that? I think that's really interesting. Um, you know, we're showing uh, um, decreased uh, cardiovascular and overall deaths, but not decreased MIs. Um, and so, you know, we know that the SGLT2 is also lower blood pressure and maybe lower weight a little bit. Is that where they're getting their benefit from heart failure? I don't think we know. Uh, band 2401 is an anti amyloid beta protofibril antibody. Uh, it has um, um, promise in. Um, Alzheimer's disease, it's a stay tuned. Uh, we're going to have to wait and see. Um, I won't be discussing this in Lincolnville because this is a uh, research uh, uh, process, but um, it's a non approved medicine. But maybe there's some hope for folks with Alzheimer's. Late onset hypogonadism. Um, I think that we're seeing a deep decline in uh, the interest in that. I still have a lot of patients come in and ask for testosterone levels. Uh, maybe one in 30 does have a decreased testosterone level, but um, we really don't see uh, a lot of benefit in people that are between 200 and 300 for their testosterone level. Uh, we do see some benefit in people that are below 200, um, but we also know that a number of them do uh, tend to have um, side effects. Uh, and uh, we need to make sure that patients do understand that uh, there are side effects associated with um, uh, these medicines. Uh, aromatase inhibitors are what the bodybuilders are using instead of testosterone at this point. Uh, they basically stop the um, conversion of testosterone to estrogen. Uh, that's why we use them for uh, estrogen sensitive breast cancers. Uh, the bodybuilders have figured out that uh, if you stop the conversion of testosterone to estrogen, you'll raise your testosterone levels. Uh, and so that does promise to be something that might be thought of down the road, but um, uh, obviously we're not using it for that at this point. Ecstasy. So MDMA uh, is ecstasy. Uh, there is some evidence that ecstasy does have some benefit for people with PTSD. Uh, it's in the uh, phase three trials. Uh, we'll be seeing if there's any real benefit from that. Um, they promise that it'll be approved before too long. Um, we're going to have to wait and see on that one, but uh, um, that is in the pipeline. Soliqua is a medicine that's a glargine insulin, a 24-hour insulin, as well as a GLP-1. Uh, there are some endocrinologists that are using this medicine for type 1 diabetics, but it is not approved for type 1s. It is only approved for type 2s. Uh, and it is a medicine that, um, you know, one would use daily. So it's got a short acting GLP. Um, it can get your number of injections down slightly. Uh, nasal sumatriptan uh, is out. Um, usually with sumatriptan, we're using either a pill or a, a under the tongue for one of the other triptans. Uh, some patients are so nauseated they can't do this. Uh, right now, there's um, a charge of uh, $800 for 16 nose pieces. Um, so that's, you know, what is that, um, $40 a piece or so. Um, so it's not inexpensive, but it's not outrageously expensive either. Um, we'll probably see this used for a while, but uh, I have not actually had a whole lot of patients that have used it. Relinta, um, I have a lot of patients that uh, have stents put in. Uh, the cardiologist will put them on the Berlinta, uh, and then they say, geez, you know, my friend was on the Plavix. The Plavix is only $9 a month. This Berlinta is $400 a month. Can I switch? Uh, the Plato trial is the trial that the Berlinta is really based on. The Plato trial did show um, improved benefit from the um, 
the um, Berlinta group. So the primary endpoint, you know, was 9.8% as opposed to the 11.7% of bad things that happened to the um, uh, to the Plavix group. Um, we also see that the event rate uh, in days 31 to 360 uh, did go down from 6.6% to 5.3%. Uh, some patients want to switch after the first 30 days, um, which, you know, the benefit actually seems to be a bit more in the in the days 31 through 360. Um, again, we're really only looking at about a 1.3% absolute risk reduction, uh, but most cardiologists do feel strongly that that is enough of a benefit uh, to keep people on Berlinta. If they absolutely refuse, then obviously uh, um, Plavix does have a, a you know some significant benefit as well, um, but um, they do need to be educated and informed. So here's the data that really talks about the number needed to treat. Uh, here's the data that talks about the numbers needed to harm, because that's the thing. When you look at the, um, uh, the Berlinta versus the Plavix, there's slightly higher risk of bleeding associated with their Berlinta. Uh, it is you know, pretty modest. The, the NNHs, or numbers needed to harm, uh, are actually you know, pretty high. Um, but they are slightly higher in the, the uh, Berlinta group. So, um, you know, more people do stop the Berlinta, uh, although it's only a modest uh, difference. Um, but, um, you know, there's, uh, there is, uh, on, on the whole, cardiologists feel like the Berlinta has an advantage. Primatine Mist is coming back. They say it'll be on the market in early 2019. I haven't seen it yet. They keep threatening it. Uh, I think that this is going to really threaten a lot of the inhalers just because the last time it was on the market, uh, you know, albuterol was just going generic and it was actually pretty cheap. Uh, now we're going to see, I think, a, a much less expensive alternative, uh, and we may have patients that start to use this instead of... Um, one of the albuterol, HFAs, you know, Pro-Air, those kinds of medicines. So uh, time will tell. Zoreso is a postpartum depression med. Again, it's uh, not yet uh, um, um, fully available. Uh, it is an interesting medicine because it basically has um, a uh, allopregnolone. Um, so basically it's a hormonal uh, medicine. Does seem to have substantial benefit. Uh, it actually modulates uh, GABA receptors, but not directly through GABA receptors like a benzodiazepine or a uh, alcohol would. Um, seems to have some benefit, but it's such a new medicine that we'll have to we'll have to wait and see. Ketamine, ketamine has now been approved uh, as S-ketamine Spravato. Uh, it's a medicine that does seem to have substantial success in people with resistant depression. Uh, it tends to work pretty quickly. A lot of psychiatrists have actually been doing um, intravenous dosing of um, about $500 a dose. They would do it uh, once a week and then um, do it weekly until the patient responded and see how long they got benefit. That's still something that some psychiatrists are going to do. It's off-label. Um, this you know, new way is now on-label. Um, it actually is a medicine that has uh, some relationship to Nemenda because it's a receptor agonist like Nemenda, um, but it is a um, medicine that uh, is uh, still pretty expensive. They're supposed to come to the office, um, take their dose, and then be observed for two hours. Do that twice a week. Uh, the initial dosing is, you know, five or six thousand dollars a month, and then at least uh, a couple of thousand. So we're going to have to wait and see on that one as well. Uh, side effects, you know, you can get a whole lot of different side effects, heartbeat, blood pressure, confusion, um, you know, less, less frequently you're going to have uh, more serious. Uh, and then uh, the rare side effects, of course, you know, you can have learning spasm, you can have heart rhythm, you can have all sorts of more serious. So this is why they want them observed in the office for a period of time. Um, you know, other th uh, side effects are a little bit more frequently, but um, are, are usually not as severe. But obviously, pressure in the eye, something you want to pay attention to.
And uh, that concludes the talk. Please um, leave any questions or comments in the comment section down below. Um, I'd be happy to respond to them, and uh, I look forward to um, hearing what you think.